day <clears throat> after Harold Hayes was named the sole editor in chief of Esquire magazine after a three man battle to prevail, he called me to request a lunch date to ask for some sort of advice. Why not? So we met at one of my client's restaurants, the Four Seasons. In a suspicious southern drawl, he told me his interest in me came from, from following my work through a few dozen articles in the advertising column of the New York Times. He, talk, he talked about my leaving Doyle Dane Birnbeck in 1960, the only creative agency in the world at that time, and my founding a hot creative agency, Papa Kenning Lois, the first agency with an art director's name in the masthead, as well as the creative director inspiring the advertising creative revolution of the 1960s. Then he came to the point. George, I hope you can help me. Can you tell me how I can do better covers? I asked him how he went about it now, and he described a team effort of editors, art director, designers, writers, meeting monthly, debating on what article deserved the cover, then all coming back a few days later and compiling and copying up four or five ideas. Huh, I said, goop fucking grope. <laughs> Is that the way you work with James Baldwin or Gay Talese or Norman Mailer? And I went on to tell him that he obviously needed a talented outside graphic designer and started to name a few possibilities. Sheet, he said, he was a southern boy. How can a freelance how can a freelancer possibly understand my magazine? I told him that if the right creative talent skimmed through the contents of his upcoming issue and couldn't come up with a powerful idea for a great cover, Harold, you're editing a shitty magazine. <laughs> Hold it, pal, he said. I, I don't get it. You all got to do me just one cover to show me what the fuck you're talking about. <laughs> I said, OK, when's the next issue? do? What's the next cover do? He said, uh, that was on Thursday, and he said, uh, Tuesday. I said, okay. Uh, tell me what's in the issue. He said, well, I got to go back and get my... I said, no, no, no. We're sitting here at, at lunch. Tell me what the, what's in the issue. He said, well, you're going to take notes? I said, I don't not, no, I don't want to take notes. Tell me what's in the, in the issue. So he went on and on, and he said this and 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 this. And finally he said, um, oh, yeah, there's going to be a spread of, um, where there's a photograph of Floyd Patterson and, uh, and uh, Sonny Liston. Obviously, there's a fight coming up. So uh, I... Knew, I knew when I heard that exactly what I wanted to do. Uh, and I said, uh, I'll deliver you a, uh, a cover on Tuesday. He thought I was so full of shit. <laughs> but on the way back, I wish, it wasn't a day of cell phones, but on, I ran back to my agency. I picked up the phone. I called Harold Krieg, a terrific photographer. And I said, Harold, uh, we've got to take a picture of uh, uh, somebody who looks like Floyd Patterson. And uh, you know, cast it, uh, get a guy who's six foot, but six foot, not too, not overly muscly. Um, go to St. Nicholas Arena, which was still uh, there, uh, still existed in, in Manhattan. Uh, this terrific, uh, terrific uh, 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 arena where there are no columns, et cetera, et cetera. And um, I'm going to take a picture of a face, you know, laying on a laying on the ring, looking like he's dead, empty. And we took, we went, we took the photograph, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And I did, did a comp on the Monday, um, sent it to Harold, Harold Hayes, and uh, waited a couple of hours. And he called me and he said, finally said, uh, Lois, I never saw a fucking cover like that in my life. I said, no shit. He said, but you're calling the fight. Yeah. Floyd Patterson is a eight to one favorite. And you're calling and you're saying that listener's gonna gonna beat him. I said, right. He said, You're crazy. 
I said, no, you're crazy because you're going to run it. <laughs> he said, why would I run it? I said, well, first of all, you've got to understand there's a 50-50 chance I'm right. Right. And uh, finally, he said, I'll call you back. Little did I know, he called me back two hours later and he said, go with it. Uh, but little did I know that I found out years later, a couple of years later, that he had just gotten to edit the job, actually. And, um, and when he showed the cover around to everybody, um, the publisher uh, said, absolutely, you can't run it. And Howell Hayes threatened to quit. To, to quit. And uh, that's how it went through. He calls me up, but he said, go. I said, terrific. I said, um, only, we, hold, hold it. Uh, we have a decision to make. He said, uh, what's the decision? We're going. He said, no. Um, I took a shot of, of um, we have to decide the color of the trunks. He said, what are you talking about? I said, I shot, took a shot of Floyd and white trunks. I took a shot of Floyd and black trunks. He said, yeah. I said, well, we have to decide what trunk, color trunks he's going to wear that night. He said, how do we do that? I said, do you got a quarter in your pocket? He said, yeah. I said, we're on the phone. I said, uh, heads, heads, it's black, heads, it's black trunks. Tails, it's white trunks. He flips the coin. He said, heads. I said, OK, it's black trunks. He said, can we take do it two, two out of three? I said, no. <laughs> That's it. The, the, when, the, when the issue came out, there was, a, there was a publisher's page from the, from the, from the publisher. And basically, he said, the publisher said, uh, um, blah, 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 blah. We don't agree with this cover. The designer, George Lois, obviously wanted to suggest that for beaten boxer, the ring is the loneliest place in the world, but the defeated fighter he shows on the canvas is Floyd Patterson, the eight to one favorite. Until events prove us wrong, we believe that Liston will be stopped and that Patterson is the one who can So they, they swore off the cover. Cover comes out, um, everybody at Esquire thought that it was the end of their jobs because uh, every sports writer in America uh, 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 laughed at the prediction, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, and they were, and they were just uh, thought, they really thought they were the, 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 that magazine was come to an end. Um, so that, that night of the fight, four days later, I think, I'm sitting at home in my, in a bedroom watching, watching television, watching a fight. And, uh, and I'm sitting there, and I'm a little nervous, and uh, and um, and the um, um, the the entourage, uh, listeners' entourage comes in in the ring, and then the Floyd's entourage comes in the ring, and my wife comes in and she sees me and she says, "What are you so nervous about, hot shot?" I said, "I ain't nervous about the fight. I'm nervous about the fucking trunks." <laughs> When I explained it to her, she said, this is interesting. And she sat down, she watched it. So we're sitting there, and we're watching, we're waiting for something to happen. And finally, Liston's robe was taken off, and he's wearing white trunks. And I remember saying, honey, there is a God. <laughs> um, so the issue, so what happened is, uh, you know, Esquire was, they were, they were considered geniuses all of a sudden. The, 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 um, I think they sold out on a newsstand and they went into a second, um, um, a second run of it, you know. And what actually happened over the years, the, 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 circ the uh, circulation uh, went from uh, 400,000 to uh, way over 2 million. Um, uh, the, um, now, I, I, how that said to me, George, you've got to keep doing my covers. This is incredible. I mean, I, I hit a gold mine here. 
I said, great. I said, I will, as, as, I will do the covers as long, and the first time uh, somebody kills a cover, I'm out of here. I'm not worried about you, but I got an ad agency to run, and I don't want to have to deal with your, uh, with your nervous ad, ad, ad salespeople and, and, and stupid publisher. He said, <laughs> he said, it's a deal. It's a deal. Um, But what happened a couple of months later is uh, a month after I, 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 uh, Howard pledged that I would have full control and the choice of subject and design of every escrow cover, I spotted a tiny piece in the New York Times reporting that the 100th GI in Vietnam had lost his life. To me, it was an early warning sign of a bad, illegitimate war. So, it just it was for Christmas issue, 1962, I sent this mock-up to Harold. I wanted to use the actual 100th GI who had lost his life in Nam, but the U.S. State Department refused, so I dusted off a Korean War snapshot of me, of me when I was in Japan on R&R, &R, hoping the power of Esquire could force the Defense Department to release the actual photo of the GI. In, in those days, Vietnam was considered a minor fracas, fracas. It'll be over by Christmas with the war cry. Since that squad covers had to be prepared two months in advance, Howard was afraid we might up with egg on our face, so very reluctantly, I killed my 100th GI cover. By the time we evacuated Vietnam almost 13 years later, with our tails between our legs, more than 58,000 American GIs have been killed or are missing in action. Um, the, um, everything was going great, and, um, and the sales were going up, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And Hal said, now, George, I, you, I love what you're doing. Everything, everything's nuts about it. The sales are going up. Um, but for Christmas, could you do me a favor? Because he knew I, normally he didn't ask me to do certain things. I mean, I just went about my business and did them all. I said, okay, what's that? He said, can you do me something for Christmas? Can you do me something Christmassy? <laughs> I said, you got it. Um, so in searching for, um, my archives now at CCNY, we dis and we dis when we discovered 27 by hand drawn comps, comps, out of a 90 that I designed a 10 year period, this is the first and only one I ever showed to Harold Hayes to warn him that it would cause a lot of trouble. Trouble, the great editor said, yeah. The early 1960s was a time of rising racial fever dominating the headlines. Dr. King, Freedom Rides, Malcolm, Malcolm X, the Black Panthers, and Elvis Cleaver, to me, were heroically driving a black revolution. Even liberals who had fought for years against racial injustice were whispering, George, they've gone too far. 18 years later, recalling the era, Sports Illustrated said, four months after Liston won the title, Esquire thumbed its nose at the white readers, at its white readers, with an unforgettable cover. On the front of the December 1963 issue, there was, there was Liston glowering out from under a tasseled red and white Santa Claus hat, taunting white America. When Cassius Clay saw the cover, he said, hey George, that's the last black motherfucker America wants to see coming down that chimney. <laughs> All hell broke loose when the cover came out. Some subscribers demanded refunds. Racist letters flowed in. Esquire lost $750,000 in canceled advertising throughout the Jim Crow South. But the courageous editor, Harold Hayes, loved it. The dozens of times I sent him a cover with the warning that it would cause trouble, he'd always say, yeah. Um, 
after cuckolding and Eddie Bish uh, Fisher on the front, world's front pages, Liz Cleopatra away down the Nile with Richard Burton, remember that? And married the hard drinking Welshman, proving over and over again that she never went to bed with a man she didn't end up, end up marrying. That was a funny line. <laughs> The media had its tasteless field day and never let up. Liz swore off interviews and photo shoots, and as every magazine in the world hounded her. I took it as a challenge to somehow cart her into, to, uh, into a, an Esquire story. But how could I entice her? I had a sweet motherly idea. Photographer T Timothy Galifas and I enticed her to pose for a surprise pullout cover, revealing her greatest love was <laughs> her young daughter. Liza, whose daddy was Mike Todd, Taylor's third husband. When Liz told the media world to kiss off, the issue became a gigantic newsstand seller. From then on, it looks like I did a lot of more of more comps, uh, of sketches. I, you, you, you go, Luke. Um, when I work, I always work with a pencil in my hand. Um, uh, in fact, it drives me crazy. If, I, if I'm thinking and I can't find a pencil or a pen, I start screaming at my wife. You know. <laughs> so this is my cheeky cover on the approaching women's movement. The year 1965 was pre-Friedan, pre-Steinem, pre-Abzug. For an article on the masculinization of the American women, I wanted to do a spoof um, of, a, of a film star caught in a manly act. The budding movement wanted liberation from women's traditional roles. The best way to draw attention to a trend on the horizon was a cutting edge Esquire cover and the approaching confusion between the sexes. But in, up, but in those uptight days, I was turned down by every American beauty queen in Hollywood, including Kim, no Kim Novak, Marilyn Monroe, and Jane Mansfield. Then, when Verna Lisi was about to de debut in America in the film How to Murder Your Wife, she recognized the humor of the manly posed, had the machismo to flaunt her beauty, and lathed it up. The Italian knockout laughed with gusto and took it off on the front cover of America's leading men's magazine. Go, go to the next one, Lou. On Sunday night, every Sunday night, you'd watch the, the Ed Sullivan show. Uh, he, he, he wowed everybody when he, uh, when he introduced uh, Elvis, but if you, I don't know if anybody was old enough to remember, but he, the camera never went below the pelvis. Uh, for, um, uh, and uh, he uh, was introducing the Beatles. So uh, I said to my wife, gee, I, I, gotta, I gotta do a cover with, uh, with Ed Sullivan wearing a, a Beatles wig. So that Monday morning, I tried to go through the channels at CBS and ask, them, and ask him to pose in a Beatles wig. My first job as a Korean War vet was at CBS working for Bill Paley and uh, the chairman, who was a big fan of my, uh, my work, and I called him up to ask for permission, and he said, uh, no way, you're gonna make fun of Ed Sullivan. So I went over to, I ambled over to the Ed Sullivan Theater, uh, which I had designed, by the way, and, um, and I camped at the entrance, and when Sullivan came out, I, I shoved a sketch of my proposed Esquire cover in his face, talked fast, and I talked fast. He took a long look at, and grinned from ear to ear, just like the final shot we took the next day. He wore his wig with gusto and smiled like Ringo. The, the next drawing I did for something that I could find was a, um, uh, it was a cover image that kicked off a, a, an issue cramped full of exhilarating uh, sports writing. Instead of a sports action cover, I photographed Darrell Death's a pugnacious New York Giants guard in the mood of a Renaissance painting trained for survival. Back then, a professional, professional athlete praying on his knees was a sight gag. 
My joke in 1965 really became a reality. In today's game, born-again Christians preach to teammates, opponents, fans, the media, and anyone with an earshot that the only way to heaven is through Jesus, insisting that those who aren't Christians are doomed to hell. This bigotry towards Jews, Buddhists, Muslims, and agnostics has divided many a locker room in America. In his second inaugural address, mediating on the paradoxes of the Civil War, Abraham Lincoln, the greatest moral leader in the Western world since Jesus Christ, intoned, both read the Bible and pray to the same God, and each invokes his aid against the other. The idea of a God who is a Giants fan, or an Eagles fan, or a Patriots fan, or a Red Sox fan, a Redskins fan, is ludicrous. And if, there is, and if there is a God who watches NFL football on Sunday afternoons and Monday nights and gives a damn, while ignoring the millions of starving children in the world, we're all in hell now. Um, when I did this cover, Harold thought I was chickening out. He said, you know, what, what's with the you know, tooth to power? What's with the kicking ass? So I said, uh, I said, uh, you know, I, I told him that 70, the 60s were a time when Americans were becoming suspicious of celebrities, uh, polit politicians, even their sports heroes. So from the balcony above these unknockables, um, Kate Smith, John Cameron Swayze, Hel Helen Hayes, Norman Thomas, Marianne Moore, and Jimmy Durante, Eddie, and Eddie Bracken, and the center of their, attach uh, their attention, the iconic Joe Lewis, I asked him to look up on our camera. The old socialist Norman Mailer was suffering from painful spinal paralysis and couldn't move, move his neck. Joe Lewis, the great Joe Lewis, leaned over and said, oh, Mr. Thomas, you never had trouble sticking your neck out before. <laughs> Miraculously, Norman Thomas looked up and the camera saw the white of his eyes. This is the first of three Esquire covers I did in defense of Cassius Clay. Um, after defeating Sonny Liston in 1964, a new champion who was not then known by his Kentucky slave name, C Cassius Marcellus Clay, announced to the world that he had become a Muslim, changing his name to Muhammad Ali. Before a, night, a, a, a November 1965 championship bout, Floyd Patterson foolishly taunted Ali by continually referring to him as Cassius Clay. To avenge this disrespect for his religion, Ali vowed he would not only beat Patterson, but he would whoop him. And so he did. He held up the near unconscious Patterson, punctuating blow after crippling blow with the mantle, what's my name, what's my name? Until in the 12th round he fell to the canvas, not merely beaten, beaten but humiliated. Eight months later, Knowing Floyd was a fair man and a good Christian, I convinced him to speak out in defense of the Muslim preacher. Ali by then was weathering a storm, a, a, a storm of controversy for changing, his, for changing his religion. When I went to see Floyd to ask him to pose for, with his torment, he agreed. But Patterson, who skulked around Brooklyn's Bed-Stuy streets wearing a beard as a disguise after losing in 1959 by blowing a title fight about to, uh, to foreigner Ingmar Johansson, insisted on a midnight shoot. No problem. I explained the cover idea of preaching Patterson and a mute Ali to a seemingly grateful Ali, begging him to receive Floyd with grace. Ali was the first trash talker in, in sports, and Floyd Patterson was the last gentleman in, in boxing. Ali was a sweetheart, but his biting tongue could have turned off the sensitive Patterson. At the stroke of midnight, always, uh, almost cowering in a longshoreman's cap and a heavy overcoat on a sweltering night in June, Floyd slipped into the studio. He saw Ali and froze in his tracks. Ali lovingly spread out his arms, almost trotted up to Patterson, whispered, hiya, champ, 
and the two champions hugged and wept. This in your face cover expressed the deep down knowledge among college students who were probably Esquire magazine's biggest readers and were known to be plastering our covers all over their dorms, that the Vietnam War stunk and that any way to stay out of it was supposedly morally acceptable. The model was, the model was a Columbia University football player, very tough, hetero, hetero. Millions of college students from those days, many, many of whom became the movers and shakers of our culture. Remember Esquire cover and its anti-war covers in the 60s with great admiration and respect. This infuriated most of America. The words of those of an American soldier in Vietnam, as reported by John Stack in a lengthy article about an infantry company from basic training through combat. The sentence leaped out at me from Sack's description of a search and destroy mission. The words are a GI's horrified reaction as he comes upon the body of a dead Vietnamese child. This cover appeared early in the war, almost two years before the world had heard of my lie, where as many as 500 old men, women, children, and babies were slaughtered by GI's. But in 1966, only 350,000 Americans were in Vietnam, and only 6,000 had died there. The outcry against the war was getting louder, but mostly on the college campuses. As a nation, we were still in a deep sleep. The cover screamed to the world that something was wrong, terribly wrong. Good American boys were trapped in an, in an evil war with no end in sight. When Hubert Humphrey was defending President Lyndon Johnson's Vietnam War escalations, Harold Hayes ran a major piece on the Vice President. I designed this punishing image of, H of, uh, of Humphrey as LBJ's dummy. Lyndon Johnson was tied up at the time, picking, or, picking out mud, mud huts to bomb in Vietnam, so I never asked him to pose. The photograph was shot in the studio using a body double as large as LBJ. Then I decapitated the photograph and substituted the president's head, one of my notorious transplants in those pre-computer days. <laughs> Two years later, I was in the Veep's office in Washington for a meeting on political advertising. I was astounded, I was astounded to see my cover hanging on the wall of his ante room. I told Humphrey that I was the author of the cover. He said, you no good son of a bitch, he told me. Well, then why do you have it on a wall? because he said, maybe it's right. Um, from the very first cover I created for Harold Hayes in 62, Esquire News stand values, uh, sales, and circulation grew dramatically. None, nevertheless, nonetheless, the magazine's ad sales gang bitched and moaned, fearful of my controversial covers. So ad pages raised, rose dramatically through the Hayes a decade. Some of my provo provocateur covers scared some agencies into pulling them off the ads. But in the sexist 60s, the ad bunch was comfortable with girly covers, and they hounded Hayes for lowest cheesecake. Hayes knew I would never harken back to Esquire's dirty old man, Esky imagery. So that Southern Baptist preacher boy, son, politely but embarrassingly, asked me for tits and ass. As I remembered my reaction, I said, Harold, old pal, you got it. I knew the great editor was planning an issue on a new American woman, so I dumped the nude young woman in a trash can. The great editor never asked for a girly cover again. Uh, this May 67 cover dealt with a, deci with a decisive TV moment uh, a year before um, when Jack Ruby shot Lee Harvey Oswald dead live 
in front of millions, old and young. Four years later, Esquire ran a story on Ruby's tortured reasoning for depriving America of the possibility of learning the full truth about the abominable assassination of President Kennedy. Photographer Dick Richards and I showed the moment as an all-American kid, mouth agape, mirroring the famous, infamous victim on his black and white TV screen, started to grow up with live violence in his carpeted den, complete with an American, an all-American hamburger and a Coke. Wouldn't you think a 1967 cover dramatizing violence against women would be applauded by women's groups? Not the National Organization of a Woman. They busted my balls. Uh, Now's pioneering battle for women's rights and against sexism in the late 60s was sensational. But the issue of fatted women was considered taboo and was not just discussed in those days. So my visualization of it on a men's magazine cover was a shocker. Ursula Andress, the stunning beauty of James Bond, of James Bond fame, uh, Dr. No, was courageous enough to pose as the symbol of abuse towards women. Stacked on newsstands next to the typically bland and inane Vogue, Harper's Bazaar, and McCall's McCovers, my battered Esquire beauty was a knockout. On the night of November 28, 1966, Truman Capote threw a little masked ball reminiscent of Versailles in 1788 in honor of the Washington Post President Catherine Graham and invited 540 of his closest friends. The most important celebrities of the time were anointed and summoned to the grand ballroom of the, of the Plaza Hotel in New York, wearing masks and dressed in black and white. Years had gone by without any important writing by Capote. He was a great writer, but consumed by hobnobbing with the rich and famous. The complete guest list, believe it or not, was published in the New York Times. A year later, the world was still abuzz about Truman's Ball. The gods of power, celebrity, cultural, and political, spoke of it as Truman's greatest coup. Norman Mailer's deft back backstab was, to me, that party was greater than any of his books. So I tried to put all the sprint to rest with a final sour grapes cover depicting an eclectic and unmasked group sweetly sticking their uninvited tongues out at Capote. And a great group of people, including Kim Novak, who when I met her said, do you design all the S.Y. covers? I said, yes, ma'am. She said, I would have loved to have posed in that cover with a woman shaving. I said, I talked to your agent. You talked to my agent? I said, yeah. I called him up and I said, I want to put Kim Novak on the cover of S.Y. magazine. He said, great. I said, I just want to let you know that I want her to take a shot of her shaving. He said, go fuck yourself, and he hung up. <laughs> she wanted me to get his name so she could fire him. <laughs> this is uh, to, serve, to illustrate a self-serving piece by Roy Cohn, um, in which he rationalized his skullduggery as the demagogue Senator uh, Joe McCarthy's favorite gopher during the 50s. I asked him to pose as the angel he thought he was, wearing a self-applied halo. He posed for the shot and said he was leaving the, and as he was leaving the studio, he said, I suppose you're gonna pick the ugliest one. I said, you bet your ass. I hate, you. I hate your guts. For once in his life, he was speechless. In the 2003 television miniseries of Tony uh, Kushner's, Kushner's award-winning uh, play, Angels in America, for a scene that takes place in Roy Cohn's office, dire director M M Mike Nichols had my cover recreated, replaced Cohn with the act of Al Pacino, framed and hanging on the wall. It would seem that the real Roy Cohn thought my cover did him justice. You 
you understand that Roy Cohn is the guy that taught Trump most of his bullshit, <laughs> that he was his lawyer. In 67, Muhammad Ali, the world's heavier champion, refused induction into the U.S. Army. He had converted to the Nation of Islam and became a black Muslim minister. When Ali refused military service as a conscientious objective because of his new freedom, new religion, a federal jury sentenced him to five years in jail for prison uh, for draft evasion. Boxing commissions then stripped him his, of his title and, de and denied him the right to fight. He was widely condemned as a draft dodger and even a traitor. When Cassius Clay had become a Muslim, he had also become a martyr. In 1968, while he was waiting for his appeal to reach the U.S. Supreme Court, I transformed him into a startling, poignant St. Sebastian. Depicting Ali as a martyr for refusing to fight in the bad war, inspired a bolder, more militant anti-war Vietnam War movement in college campuses throughout America. In the review, in the review of the MoMA exhibit in 19, 2007, uh, celebrating the induction of the last right covers into their permanent collections, the Associated Press wrote, the most iconic image of the 60s was Ali as St. Sebastian, tying together the incendiary issues of the Vietnam War, race, and religion. The image is so powerful that some people remember where they were when they saw it for the first time. Three years later, after Ali spoke at dozens of college protest rallies, the U.S. Supreme Court unanimously threw out his, Ali's conviction. Allah be praised. This 1968 cover was a, a satirical comment on 1960s TV de debates when the Whittier whiz with the five o'clock shadow lost to Jake John F. Kennedy because he looked evil in front of the cameras. Shortly after it appeared, it appeared, editor Harold Hayes got a phone call from Nixon's press secretary, Ron Ziegler. He was miffed, in fact, he was incensed. You know why? The lipstick, he said, was an attack on Nixon's masculinity. Huh? <laughs> Inexplicably, Nixon won the election against the debilitated Hubert Humphrey. After his campaign promise to end the Vietnam War, Nixon became president and exceeded all our fears when he mercilessly prolonged the slaughter for almost six bloody years as he pillarized Vietnam War resistors and prompted and engaged in the horror of the Watergate scandal, forever staining the office of the presidency. And now it's Donald Trump's turn. For the, for the August issue of Esquire, Harold Hayes ran a piece in a radical effort, believe it or not, taking place to organize a union in the U.S. military. Uh, the very thought that the U.S. Army could be unionized mid-war in the midst of the, of, uh, the, of the, the year of 1968 surely wanted some attention. So I depicted an ethnic GI chewing out a waspy four-star general in fear that this cover would cause a GI revolt. The issue was actually banned at all at U.S. military bases throughout the world. I never considered the scenario on my cover as, as totally far-fetched. In 1952, I had been drafted, and I was taking basic training at Camp Gordon, Georgia, deep in the Jim Crow South. My company commander, upon hearing me responding to a to a morning roll call with my New York accent, you, I said, you, stood up to me and bellowed, another, oh, another New York Jew fag nigger lover. I respectfully leaned in and said with my Bronx accent, go fuck yourself, sir. <laughs> I did 14 weeks company punishment and soon found myself in the middle of the Korean War.
I don't know if you remember these guys, but most Americans over 30 years old hated hippies. Translation, any kid with too much hair. So I rubbed it in their faces when I showed long-haired Tiny Tim, tiptoe through the tulips, long-haired Michael Pollard, Bonnie and Clyde, and long-haired Arlo Guthrie, Arlo's, uh, Alice's Restaurant, as three of the beautiful people and favorite performers of seven million college kids in 1968. Boy, this cover pissed off America. But the youth of America ate it up. The 60s had been a decade of titanic crusades as protests and marches advanced the fight for civil rights and women's liberation, even as the Vietnam War and its atrocities escalated. The war had laid a curse on America, like the curse that William Faulkner said slavery had previously laid on our nation. The insanity culminated in the horrific year of 1968 when Dr. Martin Luther King and Robert Kennedy were both assassinated in the span of nine weeks. I plead guilty to shockingly irreverent concepts from our co for many covers, but in 1968, the Times pleaded for equally shocking reverence. On the cover of Esquire's definitive 35th anniversary issue, I showed our assassinated leaders, the three most mourned Americans since FDR, hauntingly watching over Arlington. In this hagiographic fantasy, we pay homage to an idealized saint like John F. Kennedy, Robert Kennedy, and Dr. King in a dreamlike epitaph on the murder of American goodness and a prayer for the resurrection of American ideals. This cover's nuts. <laughs> the cover dealt with a macho piece in Esquire on fantasy woman written almost instinctively as a defense against the budding feminist war on the, of, on the atmosphere of sexism that had been a way of life in America. Um, in retrospect, though, the, um, 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 uh, in retrospect, through the these years, Esquire had championed the intelligent and accomplished woman. But while eschewing the 30s, 40s, and 50s dirty old man Esky tradition of depicting women as sex objects, Hayes and his gang of bawdy editors pricked um, a lot of sexual balloons with loads of lusty laughs. I rose to the occasion by tackling the traditional d d uh, dichotomy of a um, man's fantasy of woman that of the desire for the woman who could play the, the parts of both the Madonna and the Hua to satisfy his body and soul. The young supermodel, Rowan Martin Houghton and I, dreamt up a quartet of sexual types and melded them uh, into one desirable woman, that she wound up looking nuts, or possibly like an avenging feminist ex-murderer added to its accuracy. Uh, Andy Warhol was a fan of my ad campaigns and Esquire covers. One day I called him up at his factory and I told him I wanted to put him on the cover. Ooh, he cooed. <laughs> George Lois is going to put me on an Esquire cover. <laughs> Hold it, George. I know you. What's the idea? I said, Andy, I'm going to drown you in a gigantic can of Campbell's soup. Ooh, I love it. But won't you have to build a gigantic can? <laughs> no, schmuck. <laughs> we photographed Andy and the, and the open can of soup uh, separately. And when I put it, and when I put Andy into the can, I almost lost him. <laughs> the, co the cover has become a symbol of Esquire's juxtaposition of the, ju of the celebration of pop culture with the deconstruction of celebrity. The, the bewigged one begged me for years to trade the original art of my cover for one of his Campbell Soup can paintings worth multi-millions today. But I told Andy I would donate the original art to MoMA one day, in 2008, I did. The, 
The kids at Woodstock loved this cover, but you should have heard the but you should have heard the cops squeal. <laughs> the September 1969 issue of Esquire was already on a newsstand, and in the sweaty hands of many who went to Wood Woodstock on August 15, 1969, the many thousands who attended the muddy majesty of the three-day culture bending event had grown up and and, and matured through the apocalypse of the 60s, affected and sensitive to the seismic changes that continued to unfold around them in those horrific roller coaster years. Uh, throughout those nasty years, when anti demonstration demonstrations were met by derision, spit, and street violence, the youth of America vented their disrespect on the mean spirited arm of the authorities, the police. Esquire was barraged with bagfuls of hate mail from cops, but the cover became a favorite of the college crowd and hung in dorm for years. Actually, I wound up apologizing for the cover, N not to the cops, I apologized to the pigs. <laughs> um, In 1969, I did my third Ali cover. Um, at the time, the great heavyweight champion remained stripped of his title for refusing military service. I enlisted 12 good souls to climb into the boxing ring, constructed in the, photo in the photographer's Ira Mays' studio to ensure privacy and public, and public support Ali's right to go back to work. One giant who had agreed to join the protest was his fellow Muslim Kareem Abdul-Jabbar of, of the LA Lakers at the time. I envisioned the seven-footer standing tall, surrounded by the literary great Tumut Capote, uh, Roy Lichtenstein, uh, Howard Cassell, uh, the 12 Angry Men director, Sidney Lumet, um, the anti-Vietnam War Senator Ernest Gruning, and seven others. My dozen heroic combatants waited Patiently waited for more than two hours, but Jabbar at last was a no-show. His explanation, his explanation to me for his embarrassing absence was that he feared retaliation, not by the white establishment, but by competing factor, uh, fa factions in the, in the Muslim world. Finally, in 1971, the Supreme, United States Supreme Court stood Ali in Ali's corner, and Muhammad, and Muhammad Ali went back to work. No thanks to Jabbar. Uh, the August 1970 issue featured a sheaf of articles on the spreading youth culture. American post-war films basically remained white bread until they stoned Jack Nicholson, Peter Fonda, Dennis Hopper, and the crew. And crew brought the uh, Biggie. Uh, brought the Biggie. Hollywood students to their knees with the culture crash, crashing uh, um, easy rider. Um, I focused on an essay about the new movies and superposed a marquee touting that low budget runaway hit on the majestic doors of St. Patrick's Cathedral and headlined the new, mo the new movies, Faith of Our Children. Cardinal Terence Cook and the Archdiocese of New York were not pleased. Fuck them. <laughs> to, this, to this day, whenever I stroll past St. Patty's, I always have a craving for popcorn. In, 19, in November 1970, while William Kelly was awaiting trial for his role in the 1968 massacre of as many as 500 civilians at my line. Editor Harold Hayes scheduled an excerpt on the confession of Lieutenant Kelly. With hardly a confession in sight, it was a book based on review interviews by John Sack, who didn't believe in Kelly's innocence as much as he believed in the guilt of President Nixon, General Westmoreland, and, De and Secretary of Defense McNamara. I called John Sack and asked if he could bring Lieutenant Callie for a studio photo shoot. And Edgy Callie showed up 
I took Rusty aside to calm him down. I said that I myself was a Korean veteran and told him some more stories so he, could, so he would trust me. I explained the shoot. Lieutenant, the picture of you posing with Vietnamese children will show you, will show the world that you're not afraid as far as your guilt is concerned. The picture you said will say, here I am with these kids, you're accusing me of killing. Whether you believe I'm guilty or not, or innocent, at least read about my background and motivations. He fell fit big time. <laughs> I have experienced the violent acts of young men who are placed in harm's way. But I believe that Lieutenant Kelly was part of an invading, racist army of GIs. Racist army of GIs. And he certainly was an out of control psychopath. I had Kelly pose almost solemnly throughout the whole shoot until I said, terrific, terrific Lieutenant. That was great. Now give me one with a big shit eating grin. He did. I had the money shot. I had told Harold Hayes that I was hoping, what I was hoping for, but he certainly never expected a, a, a shitty and grin on an army officer symbolically posing with Vietnamese kids that he had murdered. This was one of my last covers. One of the biggest newsstand sales in, in Esquire's history showed the woman's, this one, the woman's liberationist Jermaine Greer looking ecstatic at the clutches of King Kong Norman Mailer, a parody of the running feud between them in public debates on TV and now on, on, the, on the pages of Esquire. When Norman Mailer saw the cover, he called Harold Hayes and challenged him to a brawl. Hayes chickened out and told the pugnacious penman to call a man responsible, me. We made a date to duke it out in Central Park. I showed up. Mailer still didn't get there. Editor Harold Hayes had always championed Mailer's talent, but the volatile writer was a constant irritant. In an editing argument between them that I witnessed, the irascible Mailer had put the word shit in at least 25 times so we'd have room to negotiate with Esquire's lawyers. After days of bickering, Harold's final offer was, Norman, I'll trade two shits for a fuck. <laughs> um, questions? As, as far as my, as far as my, Well, that's a picture of us uh, five or six years after we... Uh, you got to understand what happened uh, to, to Howell Hayes. Um, he, uh, he called me one day and he said, uh, George, you, uh, Esquire wants to make me their publisher. I said, publisher? You're not a publisher. Publisher is just an ass kisser that goes around <laughs> trying to get uh, agencies to spend money. He said, no, no, they want to, uh, I, so he said, yeah, that's right. I said, how, that can't be. He said, right. He said, so I'm quitting, t I'm quitting this afternoon. I said, oh my God. They got rid of him and the guy, I can't, when, when I started doing covers with him, when I, that first week that he that actually was the editor in chief, um, the, the circulation went from 400,000 to 2 million. Uh, they actually were almost in, in bankruptcy at the time, you know, and if anything, they should have, if they did anything with, uh, uh, with uh, his compensation, they should have, uh, they should have given him half the, the half the, uh, half of Esquire. But um, uh, unbelievably, uh, no good deed goes unpunished. And he stopped, and, he, and when he stopped, I stopped. Um, and uh, in one year's time, because 
there wasn't that much publicity about the fact that they fired him. But in one year's in one uh, in, in one year's time, it went from the circulation went from over two million to three hundred thousand. The most boom. Just be, and what it was was people were going to the rest. To, People would wait online for the Esquire magazines in uh, in, in in office buildings. The uh, the, um, the people would ask the, uh, the the people around the newsstands. They said, "When the Esquire come, comes in tomorrow?" They they would literally wait online for them. Uh, and all of a sudden, they were waiting online and they would look at the covers and saying, "This ain't Esquire." Um, and all through those years. Uh, People would say to me, and they still say, boy, you had some, some pair of balls doing those covers. I said, no, I didn't have the balls. That was he. They were, Harold Hayes had the balls. And people say, why can't they do, why can't there be George Lowe's covers done today? You know, quote, unquote. Said, there are no Harold Hayes left, you know. Thank you. Yeah. That was great.